Well, thank you, Ron, and and thank you for putting together such an amazing two days uh, around the fateful day of 9-11. I'd also like to thank National Defense University, uh, University of South Florida, and of course, U.S. Central Command and Special Operations Command. Um, I also thought before we kick off into today's meaty conversation, we should take just one second to, to reflect and remember uh, uh, the sacrifice and the heroism of so many, not only on the day of 9-11, but through today. Uh, uh, this has brought uh, the best and the hardest uh, of all of America, and, uh, and I want to take two seconds to just reflect and, and remember uh, uh, their heroism and sacrifice. Thank you. Uh, what we're speaking to today, I think, came out loud and clear in the events of 9-11, that our whole concept around national security changed and changed dramatically. Obviously, the Department of Defense uh, and our Title 10 authorities and our intelligence community and our Title 50 authorities have always been part of the national security community. But I think what 9-11 put a... Uh, put an exclamation mark on is that there's so many other civilian agencies and of course those we serve in the front lines of this war, our first responders, first preventers at state, local, tribal and territorial communities played such an, a critical role and continue to play an important role in our national security establishment community and the way we think about some of these issues. Um, dare I say we embarked upon the greatest transformation of our national security community since the National Security Act of 1947. And today I have three who are writing central, played central roles in that transformation. Three great Americans who are going to share their thoughts with us today. Uh, Mary Margaret Graham, who spent 27 plus years at the agency, at the Central Intelligence Agency, and, and, and also rose up the ranks to Deputy Director of National Intelligence. Uh, Fran Townsend, who uh, has a, a distinguished and, and a career in our national security and intelligence community. She was at, uh, at U.S. Coast Guard on 9-11 in the, in the important intelligence role, and then ultimately became the assistant to the president for national security and counterterrorism, uh, working for President Bush. So had a uh, bird's eye view on all of our efforts. Uh, and last but certainly not least, my longtime friend Juan Zarate, who had a distinguished career in the Department of Treasury, um, chased the money. The old Willie Sutton principle, why, why were our banks? That's where the money is. Well, quite honestly, we needed to start looking at how to engage those communities because our national security is more than just homeland security. It's also uh, economic security. And Juan Zarate played a critical role at the Department of Treasury, ultimately uh, making his way up to the deputy assistant for counterterrorism to, to oversee all of our efforts around uh, our global war on terrorism at the time. So thank you, Juan. Uh, without, without further ado, I want to jump right into the conversation. And, and let's start with a little bit of uh, table setting here. Day of 9-11. Where were you? What unfolded on that day? And, and, and in retrospect, what did you find most striking? And, and Mary Margaret, we'll start with you, and then we'll go to Fran, and then we'll go to Juan. So uh, please. Uh, so I happened to be in New York on 9-11. And for me, uh, still, um, on the anniversary, um, it's like it was yesterday, still, for me. Uh, this past one, I can't believe it's 20 years ago. But if I were to pick out the most striking thing about that day, having been on the streets, was um, being a block, about a block away and looking up and seeing that second plane come through the South Tower, the nose of the plane coming through the tower. I can't say much more. I mean, that still for me is um, sort of the lodestar of um, shock. In spite of everything that was going on on a national level uh, at the time, um, I, that was the furthest thing from my imagination. Thank you, Mary Margaret. Fran? So it turned out it was probably day, oh, I don't know, uh, two or three uh, at the Coast Guard when I went out on maternity leave. And so on 9-11, I was home with a newborn. Um, it was the morning of, and I was nursing the newborn, happened to have the news on. 
And because of the intelligence that had been coming in, um, the minute the first plane hit, I had this sinking pit in my stomach of what it was. Mary Margaret and I have a mutual friend who had just retired from the FBI and taken under, on the job of uh, chief of security of the World Trade Center, John O'Neill. He and I had spoken the evening before and that morning uh, I reached out to him. He let me know after the first plane hit the North Tower that he was okay. Um, and then I just assumed he was busy. And so just as Mary Margaret said that that image is for her, the last message I got from John is for me that sort of lodestar. Um, I heard from him and then I never heard from him again after the towers collapsed because he was killed when the North Tower collapsed. Um, and so from that moment forward, it was a frantic sort of effort dealing with Pat DeMauro, who was had been his deputy and others during the investigation, um, and frankly, working with John's family to get them the support that they needed and sort of everything related to, to John and the FBI. Thank you, Fran. And Juan, before you, you jump in, I, I, I'm so happy you brought up JP, John P. O'Neill. I, I, I miss him every day. So I think that's a thread connecting all of us in one way or another. And as a reminder of just how far forward looking John was, because he saw this, he saw this day. Maybe the rest of us didn't, but he did. So sorry about the, the jump in there, but uh, I do miss him dearly. So Juan? Thank you, Frank. And, and I think all of us admired John. And, um, you know, I got to watch John from afar as a very junior prosecutor at DOJ. It's where I met Fran and saw her doing her great work before she went to the Coast Guard. Um, but three weeks before 9-11, I, I had moved jobs over to the Treasury Department. So on that day, I was on the fourth floor facing south, the, 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 uh, the view of the Alexander Hamilton statue. And across the river, you see the Washington Monument and in the Pentagon. And the enduring image for me was the smoke rising from the Pentagon as we were watching what was happening in New York on our TVs. Um, and, and the very clear sense that we were at war. And for a lot of folks who had been working on the CT issues for some time, we knew that Al Qaeda had been at war with us in various ways. But the starkness of the fact that we were now facing the attacks on our homeland um, is the enduring image. We, we quickly evacuated the building at the time, and folks may not recall, but the Secret Service used to be a part of the Treasury Department prior to the Department of Homeland Security. So a small group of us um, went to the Secret Service headquarters to monitor what was happening next. And the enduring sense I had there was not just the shock and the horror of, of what was happening on TV and what we were watching, but also the uncertainty of what was coming next. There was so much uncertainty about whether or not there were other planes headed our way. We remember the Bajinka plot, right? We were looking at, there was a Korean air, uh, air airliner headed toward the West Coast that wasn't being responsive. So concerns that that potentially was hijacked as well. Uh, I remember looking out the Secret Service uh, top floor to see if there were planes headed toward the Capitol. There was just so much uncertainty as to what was coming next. Um, and then that night when I went home, I took the subway home um, and took the subway to Northern Virginia out of D.C. And there's a Pentagon stop. The subway didn't stop at the Pentagon, of course, and you could smell the smoke uh, coming from the Pentagon. And just thinking about the horrors of that day as, uh, as the night, you know, fell uh, was, was, was uh, you know, we'll always remember that sort of smell and that sense of dread. Uh, but for me, it was the shock, the recognition that we we all now knew we were at war, um, and um, and there was a lot of uncertainty that came with what was coming next. Juan, I want to start with you with the next round of questions, uh, uh, and 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 you teed it up just right. So, the, the system was said to be blinking red uh, prior to 9/11, and, and easier said than done because we don't necessarily know how to process uh, all of that data, but but there were clearly some indicators. And I'd be curious uh, in terms of warning signs you did see, warning signs you wish you saw, 
And, and, and thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, is, is how to convey or what could have been done to absorb some of this beforehand. And, and that's a tie into how we needed to retool our national security community kind of going forward. But I'd be curious what you thought some of those, uh, those indicators are and uh, um, uh, not to go back to whole setter and some of the um, yeah. uh, things from 1947, but I, I'd be curious, I mean, from the forties, but I'd be curious what some of your thoughts are on that. Yeah. And I think Mary, Margaret and Fran will have deeper insights than I on this given their roles. But Frank, I, I remember um, because I was on the USS Cole case and the embassy bombings case and um we were watching very carefully. I think the, the, the prosecutors, the intel community, the FBI agents, John O'Neill, first among them, looking at what the pattern was. And it was very clear there was a gathering storm, right? It was very clear that the, the pace of attacks were increasing. The level of imagination, I think, on the enemy's part was increasing and even some degree of capabilities. Um, and so I just remember at the time, pre-9-11, being very worried and, you know, to the, to my earlier point, having a sense that we had an enemy that was very much at war with us and that was not going to stop and was not going to stop being imaginative. And I think the real challenge in the 9-11 commission, you know, said this, well, I think the, the, the challenge was the lack of imagination on our part, which was to say, we, we saw the, we saw the meeting in Malaysia. We knew the operatives who were there. Um, we knew that there were elements in the U.S. Um, there were, you know, obviously the signs of people uh, taking, uh, you know, aviation lessons without learning how to land. You know, there were all sorts of things where there were pieces and parts and we just didn't fully imagine the worst case scenario. And I think that was a huge lesson post 9-11, maybe one that was overlearned, which was, we have to think about the worst case scenarios. We can't underestimate our enemies. And we have to realize that when you have ideologically committed non-state actors or state actors, they're going to do everything possible to attack and undermine US interests. And um, I don't think we had that mentality on September 10th, not, not everybody certainly in the national security establishment. And on September 12th, I think that was a major shift. We had to assume the worst, we had to be preventative in our approach, and we had to use all elements of national power. Fran? So let me pick up because I think Juan is exactly right. I'll take it back one more click, right? We understood that what bin Laden's intentions were, what his objective was from the 98 fatwa. Remember there was this interview John Miller then at ABC did, where he makes clear that he wants to attack the American homeland. Um, I think we didn't we didn't know whether or not to take that ser seriously at that time back in 98. But at I was running, I was at the Justice Department running at the time the unit that was responsible for the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. And as as Juan mentions these attacks, there were the East Africa embassy bombings. Then there was an attempt on the coal that failed. Then there was the coal bombing. And there was this drumbeat, right, of more bold and bold attacks. The notion of make, doing a direct attack on a US military asset um, was pretty sort of outrageous for them. And the fact that they had failed once and gone back to that same target, that was also a lesson missed, that they return to methods and targets. And I don't think we fully appreciated that in a pre-9-11 world. Um, my concern, Going forward, when I think about, we made lots of changes. We, un, we came to understand we had to care more and focus more on people and things that crossed our borders. And that made it, we took away from them one of the things they needed to attack the homeland. It was a critical piece for them. And I think it, it explains a lot why we didn't see another attack here inside the United States. But 20 years later, as Mary Margaret said, it's hard for me to imagine it's been 20 years. But 20 years later, the, our vulnerability is we're always sort of really pristinely ready to fight the last attack, right? We are uniquely positioned. They could not do what they did the last time. And I worry that that is the sort of crippling disabler 
to imagining the next attack? Are we equally prepared if what they did was a either a hybrid cyber physical attack or a uniquely cyber attack? No, I don't think so. Um, and that troubles me, right? I, I think we have to catch ourselves from always being, we'd be great at fighting that last attack. We have to, it's the sort of not have, not failing to have the imagination that the 9-11 Commission talked about in terms of anticipating the next attack. Fran and, and Mary Margaret, before you jump in, I, I, I really do want to pull that thread a little bit because hindsight is always 2020. And, and looking through rear view mirrors, obviously we see all that we hope to see and, and connect and, and have the context around some of those issues. So. After this question, I, I would like to sort of zero in on that because you're all uniquely positioned from a national security and intelligence standpoint. But Mary Margaret, please, please jump in. Uh, both Fran and Juan have said this already, but I think the key answer here is that lack of failure of imagination. It continued. I mean, we didn't expect the shoe bomber, for example. Um, and I worry that that failure of imagination um, still exists. So. If you look at that period before 9-11, all the warning signs were there. Um, the counterterrorism center at the agency was working flat out, as were the FBI, as was the FBI, and other government organizations. The one thing, in hindsight, when I got to go back and look at the whole picture about five years later, uh, all the pieces, and the one thing that I was left with, we had had better cross-agency collaboration. We might have had a chance here. But, I, you know, I, all three of us could enumerate periods and things that happened that if they had been um, talked, ac talked about across organizations, Everybody, I think, in my view, looking back, had a very good, if not great, CT focus. But we just, we weren't talking to each other enough. And even with that, maybe, just maybe, we might have spotted something. Um, but that's even, even that is a stretch, looking back. Mary Margaret, I, I just want to touch on one point because, uh, and I'll take the, the moderator's prerogative on this. So, so I had the privilege of working for President Bush immediately following 9-11 and pri in the early run-up uh, of the 9-12 environment, he would be briefed separately by then DCI George Tenet and FBI Director Bob Mueller. It wasn't until he asked for a daily matrix and actually had them in the room together that you started seeing some genuine, what the Department of Defense would call thinking purple. And, and, and I think you're right, this isn't necessarily sexy, but it is the integration where the whole can potentially become, uh, if not greater than at least equal the, the, the sum of its various parts. But dare I say, and I think everyone touched on this, Juan, I'm going to ask you point blank. Do you, do you agree with the 9-11 the, the Commission's uh, ultimate finding that this was a failure of imagination? I, I heard it from both Mar Mary Margaret and Fran, but just want to sort of get your thoughts on that too. No, ab absolutely. I, it was all, also, to Mary Margaret's point, a failure of, of process and bureaucracy. We had you know, various silos and uh, barriers. Even, and Fran will... will you know, recognize this, even within the Department of Justice. You know, I remember I was in the terrorism and violent crime section. There was a memo that was circulated by an attorney, long, long-time terrorism prosecutor, Bob De La Cruz. Fran, you may remember him. And uh, he had circulated a, a memo around shoot-down authority in case um, hijackers decided to hijack a plane and to use it as a missile. That wasn't widely circulated. It wasn't connected with the Phoenix memo out of the FBI. So what we were seeing with flight training. So even within the Department of Justice and the FBI, there wasn't uh, mechanisms, frankly, to, to be more collaborative, more imaginative about where the threats may, may be. So I think it was a, a, a lack of imagination, a lack of right structures 
um, and, and even a lack of kind of creative collaboration that wasn't there to think creatively about what, what are these terrorists actually able to do and what are they going to be willing to do? Again, the downside of having a moderator who's never had an unspoken thought, I got to throw one of my little uh, <laughs> points in here. Because when, when, when I look at, when people ask me sort of the greatest changes and breakthroughs and successes since 9-11, at least on the overseas mission, I, I honestly feel it was the synchronization of our Title 10 and Title 50 authorities culminated in, in JSOC. And we had all these capabilities, but they weren't integrated and, and there were legitimate reasons why they, they weren't. Obviously on the domestic side, we talked about the wall. And Fran, you were talking about some of the FISA sets of issues. Where do we stand today? So if I were to ask each of you, and we'll start with you, Fran, what we think, I mean, you got you have all been in, in the most uh, leadership roles, uh, not only immediately following, but in the years afterwards. If you were to take one, two, maybe three things that uh, um, added the most capacity and capability or the three things that made the biggest difference, and, and if I can also ask you to answer then what, what, what's still missing in, in, in all of that. So, um, and, and again, not an easy question, but what were the three things that you saw that built, uh, the most capacity in the, uh, aftermath of nine 11 to synchronize some of our capabilities, Fran? So I, I think we've hit, we've begun to talk about the information sharing cross agency. One of the most scratchy, for lack of a better term, relationships had been between the FBI and the CIA on the counterterrorism issue, right? Some of this was both had capabilities overseas, the CIA more than the FBI, but both did. Both had capabilities through, the, through domestic stations and the FBI here in the United States. And so where the lanes were and the authorities were, there was competition among the agencies. And you know, we think of the private sector of competition as being a good thing, not so much in the government, right? Because there, just as much as there is overlap, there are gaps that both people are missing. And so I think one of the big improvements was the relationship between the FBI and the CIA. Didn't mean it was flawless, it didn't mean it was perfect, but at least the relationship and the ties there from the very top between the director of the agency and the director of the FBI on down um, from the tone at the top, it really did get much better. Um, and that also began to help improve across the interagency, right? We had this new Department of Homeland Security. Um, I will tell you in the beginning, there were, there were concerns. Did they understand how to protect intelligence? Did they understand how to protect operations? The FBI and the CIA were concerned about sharing information with the new department. Um, we revisited that same problem when we established what was the NCTC, right? It was the Terrorist Threat Information Center in the beginning. And again, the agencies were afraid to share information. I think the lesson there was information sharing, no matter how automated you make it, has to be worked from the White House level every single day. Um, it, it's, and that's never going to change. Without the pressure from leadership to ensure that there's transparency and interagency cooperation, it doesn't happen, right? Not because there are bad people in any of these agencies, but just because each is looking through the straw of their own mission and their own authorities. And so it really does require leadership to put pressure to ensure that it happens. One of the other things I think we came to realize was state and local authorities have tremendous resources that, that we at the federal level don't have. And we didn't know and fully appreciate how to leverage that. Think about it. You know, if you have 3,000 agents in the FBI and hundreds of thousands of police officers on the street, if you can leverage those police officers as part of how you collect information and identify threats, right, it, it's just a force multiplier. Um, that was difficult, getting to a point where the Bureau and state and local authorities building a relationship of trust, I would tell you, Frank, we still have a long way to go there. Um, and there's a lot of technology that we could bring to bear to enable that better. 
Um, I think we need to make a better investment there um, because I don't think we fully learned that lesson. But we start in a post 9-11 world, we began, um, we at least began on that front. I'll, I'll stop there. There's lots more I'm sure the others will talk about. And I just want to do another underscore here because because today you see the same thing around cyber related issues where I spend 99.9% .9 of my time right now and how you sync that up, how you make sense of the data and then ultimately act upon that data. I, I feel like uh, as Mark Twain said, whereas history may not repeat itself, it tends to rhyme. And uh, just in the, for what it's worth, it's rhyming pretty loudly right now. Uh, Mary Margaret, what, what do you think the biggest, the, the big three, uh, if you were to have to identify um, uh, positive developments and then what's missing? And, and, and I really think Fran touched on something that's so important and, and that is trust. Trust takes years to build and nanoseconds to lose. And, um, and I still think we have a whole, uh, we have a long way to go in that environment. So uh, I'd be curious what some of your thoughts are. And then, and then Juan, to sort of bring in where Treasury fits into some of this uh, uh, puzzle would be great. So Mary Margaret. Um, Fran had it exactly right. I want to take it from a little bit of a different perspective. Um, after the uh, Ames case at the agency, um, one of the things that the system did, thanks to the director both of the FBI and CIA, was uh, create a deputy position for an intelligence center for a senior FBI officer. And I can't, having had that job, I can't understate how effective that was. And in the post 9-11 world, we began to do the yeah. same thing. And if I were to pick out one piece in the, and, and I'm really out here now into a, a much larger context that I think we can say um, has made a difference even today is the mandate that the DNI put on the community, all the agencies, that before you're promoted into the senior service, you will do a joint duty assignment. And so what that has meant in all these years in between is that it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but what it's meant is that people have gotten to know each other and the human connection, you shouldn't, we shouldn't underestimate. As I said, it's not perfect, but it's working better. And um, the, in the counterterrorism world, if you look at some of those points, the Phoenix piece and the Minneapolis piece, even the New York piece um, at the time, um, if, if there had been a little bit better communication um, in the Washington arena uh, among the agencies, we might, again, just might. And I'll finish with another classic example of what Fran was talking about, and boy, was a lot of blood spilt um, over this one, was when um, Commissioner Kelly hired Dave Cohen, the former Deputy Director of Operations at the CIA as his deputy, to set up an intel part of the New York City Police Department. So that caused a lot of her, um, angst. I'll be polite uh, over that over the years. But again, it was that sharing of information um, that began to um, create a community of concern as opposed to stovepipes of concern. Thank you, Mary Margaret. And, and, and just given the audience includes a lot of uh... Uh, our women and men in uniform in, in the military, it, that, that you were sort of saying the Aldrich Ames uh, concept and how we uh, uh, in, uh, took steps to, to try to mitigate and minimize uh, the, the consequences of future incidents. It's sort of like the Goldwater Nichols, where you have different tours of duty in different agencies. And, and I do want to ask you, do you feel like uh, with ODNI's uh, um, stand up, 
is the CI mission in a better uh, place today than it was, um, given a lot of that is across the uh, uh, the broader intelligence community? Or, uh, but I'll, before I jump into that specific question, we'll jump to to to, to Juan. So so Juan, and and also bring in sort of where Treasury fits in. So you, you brought up, uh, um, I think rightfully so, that a lot of people forgot that U.S. Secret Service, for example, was part of Treasury enforcement and it was part of the Department of Treasury. And uh, I might ask you where you think it should sit today, but um, now that we have some some time uh, uh, under our belts. But, but before I, I, I get to that, what are the big big benefits and changes you saw to improve our capabilities and what still needs to be done from your perspective, Juan? Frank, I'll, I'll be quick about it because I think Fran and Mary Margaret hit, hit the key themes. I think the first and most important thing was political will and attention. I think there was no question in anybody's mind what the national priority was and what the president wanted, right? It was never again, we were going to be preventative. We were gonna use all elements of national power. Um, and we were going, going to avoid blind spots moving forward if we could help it, right? So there was never a question of political will. You know, Fran was in the, in the Oval Office all the time, and, and, and we spent a ton of time with senior leaders uh, throughout. So there, political will and attention is critical in, in this whole sort of dynamic. And, and this is one of the concerns moving forward, whether or not we've got the political attention span uh, to, to worry about what the threats around the corner may look like. So that's one. I think second, the information sharing environment as it was called in those days and the, the intense focus on integration of information where possible. Uh, in our world, I think the creation of the National Counterterrorism Center, as Fran said, was critical at a minimum because it forced these questions of what should that look like? Uh, what does the coordination mean? Uh, and even if it wasn't perfect, and even if there were, there were fights along the way, and there were, um, we were grappling with those questions, and we were creating an institution that would force that. And so we would start and end every day with what NCTC would bring to the table in terms of the threat matrix. Um, and that was critical, right, in terms of that integration. The last thing I'd say, Frank, and it goes back to your point about Title, title 10, Title 50 integration, was the way we began to think about the use of all elements of national power across the streams through a preventative lens, right? Preventative paradigm. And it was, you know, DOJ and FBI reshaping their mission. It was obviously DOD marching forward. It was the agency being much more aggressive, you know, with its capabilities uh, in, in hard and soft ways. And it was agencies like the Treasury that were suddenly thrust into a warlike uh, setting where they had really not been before. They had had roles and sanctions and anti-money laundering prior, and certainly with customs and secret service were involved in some elements of national security. But really the question was, how do you use those key attributes of all these departments, like the treasury, financial information, authorities, tools, relationships, to undermine the ability of terrorist groups and America's enemies to operate around the world? And in the case of treasury, it was, how do you bankrupt these groups? How do you make sure that they can't get access to capital? How do you make sure that you're undermining the way that they raise and move money around the world, right? That became the mission. Um, and organizations were then built uh, to, to drive that, the Office of Terrorism and Financial Intelligence, uh, the Office of Intelligence and Analysis within Treasury, which is the only finance ministry in the world that has uh, an intelligence shop built into it. Um, the very notion of threat finance, which is now a kind of a military doctrine. We created the threat finance cell in Iraq. It was CENTCOM and Treasury that were leading that. Uh, in Afghanistan, the Afghan threat finance cell was uh, the combination of CENTCOM and DEA and Treasury. So this idea that we need to integrate the authorities, the capabilities, the information to do maximum damage to our enemies, that was really the, the, the mantra. And I think we did that, and you had very... You know, you know, important leaders like Fran and Steve Hadley and others at the White House that were constantly driving that integration and those integrated strategies. So I would say those three things, Frank, political will, information sharing environment, and integration of national resources. And since you didn't do it, I'll do a quick plug for your book, Read Treasuries War, if you need, uh, if you need more information. Sorry, Fran. Thanks, Frank. 
No, let me just add, because one is quite right. We wound up with an all instruments and national power. I think it's important to understand how we got there. What we looked at was what do these groups actually need to survive and thrive? You need people, you need weapons, you need communications, you need money, right? You need safe haven. And so when you looked at each of those categories, you said, okay, how, what strategies, what authorities, what capabilities do I have to deny them of each of those? And Treasury was the lead on the money side. How do I choke them off of any resources and, and that would enable them to buy the people, buy the communications, buy the money, right? Uh, you know, buy the weapons. Mm -hmm. And so Treasury played a critical, critical component to choking off one of their essential requirements for success. Hey, Fran, I want to pick up on that because uh, it, it is a key point. And, and looking at where we are today, and dare I say the past few weeks have not been America's finest day. And, and we've always wanted to keep the pressure on. If you're looking over your shoulder, you're not plotting and executing attacks. So ungoverned spaces, safe haven, is really critical to uh, our adversary's ability to, to maneuver. What do we? What are we looking at today? Where arguably we certainly have less ability to collect intelligence on the ground, um, and uh, dare I say, probably less ability to influence uh, a, a regime that is no longer. Uh, run by the, the Afghan government we've known for a while, which obviously had all all sorts of warts. But uh, but what what does it mean today, given what we've seen uh, uh, unfold in the past few weeks? And Fran, maybe I'll start with you, then Mary Margaret, and then then turn to Juan. So where where are we? Yeah, look, not only is Afghanistan now reverted to a safe haven, it's a safe haven that is once again governed by the very same Taliban that gave Al Qaeda safe haven pre 9-11. Um, and so if you're not, I don't care Republican or Democrat, if you're not worried about that, you're not paying attention. So it's an extraordinary critical problem in terms of our the threat. The other piece to this, I think we've got to be honest about, you talk about lessons learned, how are we going to deal with Pakistan? The rise of the Taliban could not, the re-rise of the Taliban could not have happened without the support financial and capability wise of the Pakistani ISI. I will tell you when I look back on, we had a critical choice to make. Once we had gone, put military forces into Afghanistan, we were either going to try and work with Pakistan and they were going to be, as President Bush said, with us, or they were going to be against us. The judge, the policy judgment immediately post 9-11 was to try and bring them with us. I think those of us on this call for sure knew pretty early on that they were with us in words only. Every time we shared information, every time we tried to do a tactical military operation, that information leaked and it was unproductive. And so the truth of the matter is we came to find early on the Pakistanis were never with us and we never really tackled that issue partly because we needed them not to do even more harm against our military forces in Afghanistan. Um, but we're going to be forced to tackle that issue now, right? Pakistan is a nuclear state. Um, they have their own stability issues when it comes to Islamic extremism. They've never had control of the federally administrated tribal areas. Um, and so they are their own, they are their own problem but it is inextricably linked now to the rise of the Taliban in Afghanistan. And we're just going to have to tackle this regionally as we should have in my judgment from the very beginning. The only people who benefit from our lack of having done that are the Chinese and the Russians who have, and the Iranians who took advantage of the vacuum um, by, by our lack of a policy, a, a policy, a strategy that addressed both Afghanistan and Pakistan. Really, really glad, glad you brought that up, Fran. I'm going to turn to, to Mary Margaret, but but I, I think it, in addition to the regional implications uh, and obviously the, the threat directly to the homeland and our interests, of course, o overseas, it's also emboldened our adversaries, uh, uh, jihadist organizations in Africa and elsewhere. So 
it, it, it has reverberations of, of different types. And, and I'm really glad you brought up Pakistan because uh, um, that discussion needs to be had in earnest. And uh, I think I heard you loud and clear that we didn't learn, or, or we did learn. It's just not the uh, answer any of us were, were hoping to see. But Mary Margaret, if you want to jump in on, on this conversation, where are we today? What are the implications and, uh, and, 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 and concerns? And if there are any uh, ponies in there, I'd love to hear them. So uh, um, over to you. Well, I don't have any solutions for you, but I do have uh, the comment I would make to follow on what Fran was talking about is um, the challenge that the situation we're in today presents to the intelligence community, to the military, and to the policy level of the U.S. government. But the foundational I think I can say this. The foundational information here is called intelligence. And we cannot, as a nation, cross the 17 agencies now um, in the community. We cannot, just because we are not there, we cannot stop looking at the situation in Afghanistan with all of its, its tendrils. Um, and it almost is the biggest challenge we've faced, given the potential for harm since 9-11. Frank, there's a lot to say on this issue. And yeah, no kidding. I know there's a lot of emotion attached to it as well, and especially for those who served and had multiple tours, tours of duty in Afghanistan. Um, it, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to grapple with the, the emotional aspects of this, but let me, let me just break it down this way from a or a counterterrorism perspective. I, I don't quite understand some of the assumptions that have been made around the decisions. Now, very, very difficult question as to what, what long-term stability in Afghanistan would have looked like or should have looked like. But the assumptions that seem to have been made about the ability to um, disrupt terrorist activity from afar without a presence on the ground, I think is faulty. I think the, um, the, the issue that uh, yeah, Al Qaeda, ISIS, and the ideology and the violent manifestations have uh, metastasized regionally, places like Africa and elsewhere. That to me is not uh, not a reason to abandon the field and to allow safe haven in a place like like, Af like Afghanistan. And the lack of appreciation, I think, for the animating features of what is seen as a, as a victory for the Taliban against the United States, especially 20 years after uh, we toppled the government and we disrupted the safe haven, I think is foolhardy. I think there's a, the, the global jihadi movement will be animated. You now have a safe haven in earnest in Afghanistan. We are now um, more blind to the threat than before. And we've always said that intelligence is the long pole in the tent in keeping us safe, whether it's in the context of what plots are being uh, devised in the Fatah or in eastern Afghanistan, or what individuals we've got to put on the, uh, the, the no-fly list uh, and, and check as they're coming into the U.S. So the, the decision-making here and the assumptions, that I think, are, are, are built on the luxury of 20 years of having done a fairly good job of disrupting safe haven and getting comfortable that we can contain the threat without a recognition that the threat will continue to metastasize. And these are groups that are still animated, still see us as the far enemy, uh, and have learned a lot of lessons, whether it's been in Iraq and Syria or elsewhere uh, around encrypted communications, use of drones, uh, armed drones, uh, other capabilities that are really um, dangerous. And so Again, I, I worry about what, where we started, which is a failure of imagination, where, where there's the sense of, hey, we don't, need to, we don't need to fight the last war, of course, but we need to imagine the war that these terrorists will continue to wage and will continue to animate. And so that's where I'm worried, Frank, uh, given uh, sort of our collective experience and, and view of the world. And I, and, I, and I do have real problems with some of the decision-making that has been made in recent weeks. Very, very sobering assessments from all three of you, and uh, uh, and I think spot on. 
Um, I, I, and one question before we have a wrap up question, because the tyranny of time requires I'd be a bit of a tyrant here, but what about the ideological underpinnings of all this? Have we recognized the significance of that, or is it not as significant as perhaps uh, I've historically thought it was? Uh, anyone want to take that on? Of the adversary. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe I'll go first. I, I think it's a critical animating feature of the movement. Um, there's, a, there's an ideological sort of heritage or lineage to these groups and these individuals and even between ISIS and Al-Qaeda, which are rival groups, there's a, there's a deep heritage. And I think one of the things we've seen over 20 years of fighting these groups is the, the global jihadi DNA, the idea that uh, the United States needs to be attacked as the foreign enemy, is now embedded in all of the local jihadi uh, narratives and ideologies. And this is made altogether worse with broader extremist sort of uh, tensions around the world where this ideology still has purchase with young people, uh, has the ability to kind of adapt to different environments, and frankly has not abandoned the idea that it needs to use extreme violence uh, to include potentially weapons of mass destruction against the United States and their enemies. So, you know, that ideology is still animating these groups, whether or not it fully you know, metastasizes or manifests, it's a different question. But the ideology, I think, is key, and it's one of the things we tried to focus on over the last 20 years. Friend Mary Margaret, either of you want to touch on that? The only thing I would add to what Juan said, I agree wholeheartedly, is I think we have to be honest with ourselves. I don't think we were hor terribly effective. We understood the importance that you and Juan have both articulated. I just don't think we developed a very effective strategy. State tried to, to develop a strategy against it that it was mocked for, frankly. Um, we had, because of our own constitutional concerns, we, we were uncomfortable with the agency and our military tackling it. Homeland Security didn't really have that capability. The FBI and the Justice Department, it wasn't their mission. And so if this was as important as it was, this issue was an orphan. Nobody, because whether it was authorities or capability, nobody really owned it. Um, and so I think we have to be, sort of look ourselves in the mirror and say, we failed at this. We've just not, we, we the kinetic part we know how to do. The ideological part we're not as comfortable with, um, which is sort of should be surprising to us. During the Cold War, we did understand how to take on um, Russia in, a, in the Cold War in terms of an ideology. We've lost that capability, we, and we just never found our footing over the last 20 years. And I think if we understand it to be as serious as both you and Juan articulated, and I agree with you, then we have to devote the resources, the energy, the people, um, and the intellectual capacity to say, what are we going to do about it? But this is another lesson learned for me. I don't think we've done a very good job at it. Footstop, well said. I I couldn't agree with you more. And and the country that invented Hollywood, Madison Avenue, we're getting sort of our clocks clean. But Mary Margaret, do you want to jump on that? The only thing I would say to add, because I completely agree, um, is this is another one. We aren't there, and we weren't 20 years ago, and we still aren't, and it's that whole whose authority. We need to get over that, and we need an all of government, just like we did with the other issues that we faced. Um, and did a pretty good job at, a la, for example, Juan's role at Treasury. Um, that wasn't necessarily something that we did when we started, but this requires that exact same piece. And we got we have to get over the authorities' issues. Well said. And and I just might uh, again, I can't stop myself. Throw another underscore here. I, I mean, it's not about the technology alone. Technology plays a role, but technology changes. Human nature remains consistent, and we're going to have to be, bring unique, creative, and and ultimately prioritize uh, this as a set of issues. So if you ask me, that's one of the underpinnings that we have to tackle and we did not tackle effectively. I'm gonna, we've got time for one more question and, and this is sort of the unfair question. And I'm asking you to compare and contrast where our counterterrorism uh, uh, 
community is today and, and our homeland security posture is today vis-a-vis 9 12 2001. Um, Fran, why don't we start with you and then, and we only have time for quick answers and, and then Mary Margaret, and then we'll close out with Juan. So look, our, our capacity, our capabilities are far more mature today than they were on 9-12. That was quite deliberate and it was very, very expensive, but we did it. It ought, we ought to, the lesson from that for us ought to be when we turn our resources and our attention to something, we are capable of doing tremendously difficult things and we're, we're capable of doing them quickly. Um, having said that, that ought to concern us as to why we haven't done that on cyber. I agree, Leon Panetta and I have had many conversations about this. The next one will be a cyber 9-11. And will we say what, I, I, I can't bear the thought, frankly, of the country having another conversation about what could we or should we have done the day before? Um, we're still having this conversation. We still don't have, I recommended to the Obama administration, create the, a national cyber center that has offensive and defensive capabilities. So the president has one place to go that's an interagency capability. And you can shift, just as Mary Margaret talked about the National Counterterrorism Center, who's the, who's the director and who's the deputy? We know how to do this. And the fact that we haven't done it yet um, is so frustrating because it's when you pull all those agencies together on an issue like this, you do begin to understand where are the overlaps of authorities and where are the gaps of authorities? Where are the overlaps of capabilities? Where are the gaps of capabilities? Once you understand that across the federal government, you can begin to bring in others, whether it's international or state and local. But there is we, we understand the urgency of this threat and we have not done the hard work that we need to do in advance of a major scale attack. Very well said, and I might add what makes cyber a little unique is the role the private sector plays here. Not only are they partners, they're in the front lines of this war, and quite honestly, not many companies went into business thinking they have to defend themselves against foreign intelligence services, which is precisely what's happening. So, and I got to throw one other idea to empower the National Cyber Director and Chris Inglis's job so he can get the job done. We need offensive and defensive coordinators coming into a head coach. So thank you for that, Fran. Uh, Mary Margaret? Uh, one piece which might not be um, popular and might be able to be deleted if you don't think so, but I think <laughs> we had another example uh, on January 6th of things that weren't working. The communication piece of that event, we had plenty of warning, but the communication piece did not work. Um, so that's another example of, in spite of all the positive things that I think the three of us have said today, it shows us one of the gaps that we need to be, and I get it, that it's really hard to collect intelligence domestically. But somehow we have to uh, put our arms around that or we're going to face more of what we saw. That's it from me. Mary Margaret, terrorism is terrorism. Crimes are crimes. We're agnostic to uh, what fuels it. So thank you for bringing that up. Juan? Frank, on September 12th, uh, 2001, we were resolute but immature in our counterterrorism. We, we had to build up our information sharing as we talked about our joint operations uh, use of you know all elements of national power, leveraging the private sector, to your, to your point, Frank, which the Treasury focused a lot of time and effort on, DHS eventually did. Um, now, in September 2021, I think we are quite capable but confused, right? And the confusion, I think, comes from part of what Mary Margaret just described, which is we've got a domestic uh, violent extremist challenge in addition to the international terrorism challenges that we confronted post 9-11. What should that focus be? What are the authorities? How, how do we operate? Um, I think there's confusion post Afghanistan. How do we deal with the aftermath of uh, an Afghanistan now run by a terrorist organization in league with the Haqqani network and Al Qaeda? What does that even mean? Uh, you know, there's discussions about legitimating that regime or recognition of that regime. Um, 
I don't know what that looks like or, or means. And so um, I would say, at least from the outside, we are incredibly capable, um, but we are quite confused in, in 2021. Juan, Fran, Mary Margaret, your insights were a gold mine today. Thank you not only for sharing your time with us today, but for all your service over the years and, and, and for doing all you can to make our country safer and more secure. Uh, please know I personally uh, appreciate that greatly. You couldn't ask for three better uh, Americans to, to, to fight that war. And, and I know our audience does as well. Uh, without uh, further ado, thank you. Uh, Ron, back over to you. And uh, um, thank you.